Thanks. Okay. Is the indie movement over? I think it's it's healthy, right, for for any art movement uh, to ask that once in a while. Is, is it over? But why why would I even ask that? Why would I go there with this talk? Uh, well, a lot of people keep on saying these things to me. I keep on hearing it's kind of rumblings and grumblings, and I don't want to pick on Edmund Mac, uh, McMillan in particular. He's the developer of uh, Super Meat Boy, but in January. He uh, gave this quote that really sort of sums up this kind of uh, position. You know, he says, uh, indie the indie scene uh, has lost sight of its foundation. It's become a social scene that's become split into even smaller scenes that think they're right and everyone else is wrong. And things used to feel united, uh, but now it feels very segregated. Everyone's hating on everyone else. It's become a high school experience all over again, and I don't fit in. And, you know, I, th I think, like, this is the most famous example I could find of somebody coming out on the record and saying this. The related idea that I keep hearing more and more uh, going around is, is this idea that uh, the movement isn't necessarily over, but that the category indie has become kind of useless as a, it's like meaningless as a, as a way of referring to indie games, outdated. Uh, like, it's identifying a kind of a union of characteristics that no longer exists in any uh, ind independent developer in a game. Uh, so, for example, this was on Rock, Paper, Shotgun, uh, this, this uh, little quote here about how the term indie uh, has become this effectively meaningless term that is the cursed, reanimated mummy of the gaming world. Now, I feel like those claims are set up with the idea that indie once had this uh, special particular meaning, not, not a long time ago, but, but relatively recently, that there was this special movement of indie games that got started between 2005 and 2008 with games like pa Passage or Aquaria, uh, Cave Story, Super Meat Boy, uh, or Braid. And to be fair, that's when indie becomes this symbol, this, that's, this word that's recognized by mainstream audiences. Uh, it's entered the mainstream uh, games vernacular and it starts to become this kind of heavily overloaded term with, with dozens of framings and meanings, uh, many of which are borrowed from indie music, indie films. So exp experimental indie games are creative, they don't have a publisher, they're personal, they're cool, they've got low budgets, they're intellectual, uh, artistic, uh, uh, niche, <laughs> really artistic. Uh, <laughs> pretentious, uh, they don't make profit, they're weird, they're cheap, untechnical, they're independent being really a, a key one. What I want to recognize in this talk <laughs> is the fact <laughs> that there's this newly loaded word is not necessarily evidence that the things we equate with being indie uh, appeared out of the blue in 2008 or 7 or 2005. I think historical uh, literacy is really bad in the indie scene. Um, I feel like if we put indiness as a set of characteristics into its proper historical context, we might not have the same kind of anxiety about the future of indie games that Edmund has. Now, I'm not trying to present myself as being some kind of expert historian, expert on game history. Uh, Lane Nooney gave a really fantastic talk yesterday that had a real robust historian's methodology. This is not like, this is, this is more like, uh, think of this as, a, as an old man telling stories and it's sort of an insider's uh, view of the history. So I, I want you to feel free to correct me on the facts at the end of this talk, but I hope you also engage with the uh, substance of this talk, which is an argument that I'm making. So people have been making games for a really, really long time, uh, probably going back to prehistory with cavemen throwing rocks around and clubbing each other. But I'm here to talk mostly about the history of video games, and the history there starts uh, sometime in the early 20th century. Oh, sorry, in the mid 20th century, I should say. So in the beginning, everything looked like an indie game. Uh, there were no budgets, <laughs> there were no public releases, uh, there was no publishing, there were no large teams, there was lots of experimentation. Uh, so this is Space War for the PDP-1, one of the earliest computer games made by Steve Russell, who was a student at MIT. And things gradually got commercialized as the golden age of uh, the arcades got underway, but it was still small teams with, with hardly any 
artistic constraints, working on very short uh, timelines, low budget. So this is Asteroids, 1979, which is, which is by two guys, uh, Lyle Rains and Ed Logg. Still really an experimental game, still creative, still rapid turnarounds. But then the home console industry exploded in Japan and America, and things got rapidly hyper-commercialized. And you know, this is familiar stuff. I'm telling you familiar stuff if you're, if you're American. Uh, that's, that's, you know, you're aware of this. And you know, they, we, we, talk, we often talk about the video game crash of 1983. So this is a chart that's from uh, Hughes uh, Johnson. Uh, so there's, this, I, there's a story that's told, which is that the uh, video game craze led to this rapid proliferation of, of console platforms. Everybody was experimenting, and it was kind of a frontier, and you can see that just before the red line, which is the crash. And then there was this collapse that left only a few players in the game. And consequently, it got pretty hard. If you're an indie, indie developer, it was pretty hard to get onto a console, like two reasons. Uh, number one, I guess manufacturers had been burnt by, uh, by uh, publishing low-budget games in the past. And number two, they just had all the power. There was no leverage for indies. We couldn't get onto consoles. And so the story goes that when things pick up again in terms of uh, console proliferation in the mid-90s, the budgets and the team sizes are just way too high for indies to be involved. And the publishers are running everything. So nobody made an indie game uh, from 1983 until the mid-2000s when Clism released Sakeless or when Cave Story came out or Braid or something like that. That's the story you usually hear. That's the story of indie games that you hear. But that's a pretty weird way to tell a history, right? You, you, should, you should be wondering when you hear that, where did all the independent developers go, right? None of the indie developers that I know would pack it in just because they couldn't get on a console. Uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't go to work at EA or Ubisoft or at a bank. Uh, they'd keep making games. Uh, they, it wouldn't matter whether they could make money doing it. It wouldn't matter whether they had to go through a distributor. They'd continue to do it. So where did the independent game developers go after the crash of 1983? Well, this chart from uh, a Simcoe tells you, or gives you a little bit of a clue. This is the other side of the crash story. Again, I've marked the crash as a vertical line there in red. It's the other part of the crash story, a part which is forgotten, I think, in the bulk of uh, verbal American uh, video game history. Uh, the indie developers moved to computers, which began to proliferate, and the number of platforms proliferated just at the time when the proliferation of consoles was coming to a halt. One of the things we associate with indiness now is the use of, uh, of tools that make it possible to work quickly or to work alone even, uh, or in a small team with little or even no programming knowledge. Uh, this is one of the things that you really need a general purpose computer for, right? You need, you need to, to, to have this thing that you can access all of the bytes and you can, uh, you can, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, so we think about these, these uh, modern indie tools like Twine uh, or Unity or PuzzleScript, which, which open the door for people to come in and, and work on their own and for, be for beginners as well and for amateurs. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a little bit of the history of that. So in 1983, uh, ar the architecture student Douglas Smith prototyped Loadrunner in, in one week on a campus mainframe and then he ported it to the Apple II. And this is a, the first game that I can find, it may not be the first of, of all, that shipped with a level editor. So because people had access to the, to the files on their computer, they could save and they could exchange levels, kind of a big deal in an era when writing a game meant usually that you had to do it in assembly or in machine code with a pencil and paper. Here was an editor that you could use with a joystick. Nobody knows about, about this uh, here that I've spoken to, but the first thing to be called Game Maker was a Commodore 64 program called Gary Kitchen's Game Maker that came out in 1985. This is really the first all-in-one IDE. It let you do uh, graphical editing, level design, scripting, all on a Commodore 64. And you know, it was kind of a pain to use uh, by the standards of the tools we have today. But it was popular enough, and it was followed up by many other things in this genre. There was shoot 'em up construction kit, uh, there was the arc arcade game construction kit, the adventure game construction kit. It was a little fad. And there were a lot of people making little uh, amateur grade, not really releasable, but nevertheless, independent games uh, on those platforms. ZZT, 1991, uh, like Load Runner, was a game that came with a, with a level editor. And people still make ZZT games today. In fact, Clism is the guy who made Sakeloose. A lot of people in this room attribute as being the game that Turned them in, made them realize that they could become an indie game developer. 
was originally a ZZT guy. And that was written by Tim Sweeney, who went on to found Epic Games, who makes uh, Gears of War now. Uh, Worms is a game people are familiar with. Not many people know that it was written in Blitz Basic on an Amiga uh, before it was picked up by Team 17 and ported to every single platform under the sun. <laughs> and this is the first hit game I can find, the first real big commercial game that was made in one of the all-in-one tools. The rise of Windows, the kind of increasing importance of Windows as a platform is an interesting time for indie games as well. It's got this kind of nuts and bolts application type focus as an operating system. And I think that started to make game development easier, just at, also coincidentally at a time when it was getting to be financially impossible uh, for indies to use traditional publishers. So this is Click and Play, 1994, is made by a guy who had made uh, basic variants, uh, Amos and STOS for the Atari ST and Amiga, uh, which, like Blitz, again, a kind of an all-in-one package that was an uh, easy way to make games. Click and Play is a, is a system that can be used even by school children uh, to make games. And people are still using that today as well. And then, of course, we can't forget the second coming of Game Maker, uh, the biggest, most successful of the all-in-one tools. So this is uh, Mark o Overmars released this in 1999. I just want to bring this up because you know, that's 15 years ago now, right? We think about this as being a kind of contemporary tool that's making it possible to make games in a way that wasn't previously possible. It's 15 years ago. You know, it would be five years uh, after that came out before Seiklus came out. So it was a, a, you know, a while before there was a real popular hit on Game Maker, but it was there uh, for quite a long time. In 1999, it was really, really hard to get a 3D game out as a small team. And I think you know, the budgets were really going through the roof. And many indies turned to modding. So uh, and that's another way that indie developers have been able to, to access game design. You know, it's another tool that people have been able to use is to modify existing games. So in 1999, uh, Min Lee made Counter-Strike, which was for quite a while the most popular game in the world, a mod of Half-Life. And then Shockwave and Flash made it possible to put playable games right there on the internet in a browser window. And I, I think importantly as well, a kind of all-in-one development frameworks that let in hundreds of thousands of, of game developers who previously uh, were prevented for technical reasons from making games, including myself. Uh, but these tools, I'm trying to just t tell you this story so that you realize that there, there, there were tools, there was access, and there were ways to get into game development as a beginner since 1983. I think it's also important while we're on the note of Flash and Shockwave that we don't tell the story as though the internet is the first indie self-distribution platform. Uh, in the 1980s, if you couldn't get a deal with a publisher, you had limited options for how to distribute your game. So a lot of small teams published free games by sending the code in byte by byte into a magazine, which they would then print out. And uh, the readers of the magazine would type it in, number by number, into their computer. This is an actual scan from a magazine. People would have been doing that. Uh, if you got one number wrong, it just wouldn't run. <laughs> As games got too complicated to type in, uh, there were some alternatives. So uh, magazines would run with cover tapes or cover discs. where They, they would take a, a collection of freeware games uh, and demos and put them on a free disc or a free tape that was uh, sticky taped to the front of the magazine. Uh, your other option was you could uh, lodge your game with these, uh, these mail order catalogs where people could send away a blank tape or a blank disc uh, and get freeware, which at the time, they weren't called indie games, they weren't called uh, freeware games, they were called public domain games. That's, that's another way that you could distribute them. But the bottom line was, uh, if you needed a deal with a publisher if you wanted large scale distribution, uh, just like Indies need deals with publishers if they want to get their games on Xbox or uh, PlayStation today. In the late 80s, uh, things started to open up more than that. So in 1987, uh, Cross was released by Scott Miller, who went on to form 3D Realms, which published games like Duke Nukem uh, 3D. Uh, so this marks the beginning of people using the shareware model of business, which is sort of fundamentally indie business model uh, for video games. So it was pioneered by VisiCalc, which was a Apple II uh, spreadsheet program earlier than this. But I think small teams, whether they were making games or, or software, realized that they didn't need to get 
uh, a distributor involved. They didn't necessarily need to form their own publishing house like people had been doing in the earlier, like earlier in the 80s. They could just sell direct uh, to fans. So that started to take off. And there was still, I mean, even at that early stage, there was electronic distribution uh, for games as well. If you wanted to distribute games completely independently of anybody else, one of the things you could do is you could put them on a, a bulletin board system, a BBS, uh, by dialing your computer in with a modem, accessing somebody else's computer and uploading the files. And that's what a lot of indie game developers did at the time. I love this video. This shows the basic process for how you do it. It's not easy. It's not like going on the, uh, the internet and accessing a website. <laughs> Uh, but it's, you know, fundamentally, uh, on a small scale, it's the same thing. This is, I won't, uh, <laughs> I won't force you to watch the entire process. It takes quite some time. BBS games became like a huge deal for indie game developers. Yeah, you, could, you could log in remotely, you could download uh, public domain games, as many as you want. You, even in many cases, uh, people pirated commercial games this way, of course. This is a game by Mike O'Brien uh, called Pyro 2. It's one of my favorite games uh, of all time uh, that he released for free before he went on to form ArenaNet later in his career and make Guild Wars, uh, really recommended. And there were games that you could play on a BBS as well. So this is another way that indies uh, distributed their games was to make games that would run on BBS software. This is uh, known as a door game. So Trade Wars 2002 was the most popular uh, of the door games. It ran for a really long time. Uh, just like something like a massively multiplayer game, but with a handful of people playing asynchronously, and often written by single developers uh, working in their bedroom. So this, is, uh, this was written by Gary Martin in 1984. When uh, Java, Shockwave, and ultimately Flash arrived, for the first time you could self-distribute your game to a huge audience. Uh, almost for nothing. But I just, it's important to realize how long ago this was. You know, 1999, uh, this is when it really started to happen. New, Newgrounds started to pay for games. AdSense uh, and ad other advertisers started to pay. And you could make a mod modest living as a game developer working by yourself, or even a big one. So Neopets by Adam Powell and uh, Donna Williams started in 1999, sold in 2005 for $160 million. And then coming full circle, Alien Hominid, uh, was the first indie game in years to make it back onto the console. So that's, that was on the Wii. Originally a Newgrounds Flash hit uh, that was taken over, sorry, not to the Wii, to the GameCube. Uh, and it was the first time a console publisher had taken a chance on a Flash game. And it just it was kind of a no-brainer no for Nintendo, right? They knew there'd been like hundreds of millions of plays on this, of this game on Newgrounds. It was sort of forcing its way back into that commercial market. Around the same time, the open internet was enabling a resurgence in downloadable freeware. So uh, I just wanted to point out uh, Sold That, by, this is by Polish developer My, uh, Michael Markinkowski, um, which is one of a number of games that was distributed on sites like Two Cows. So there, suddenly there was free hosting. And if you, you could just make a game on no budget and you could put it out and it could, you know, even if it was quite a large file, people could get it for free. So self-distribution, uh, didn't appear in 2005 either. That was there from 1983 forward. It has been getting easier over time, but uh, that's, that's, you know, that's a, a long and kind of storied history. The indie superstar success stories like uh, Super Meat Boy were always there too. Uh, maybe not at mine, Minecraft's level of scale, but definitely not Small Potatoes either. So uh, in his keynote on, uh, on Friday, uh, Rami was talking about these publishers that have recently appeared, and it's true, the bunch of publishers have recently appeared that want to buy, seek out and buy up indie developers and indie games, like Devolver, for example. And there's a really long precedent for this, although it kind of died away somewhat recently. Uh, so this is Wizardry. Uh, Andrew Greenberg and Ro Robert Woodhead uh, wrote this while they were students at Cornell. And uh, it was published by a small publishing house called Siratech, later called Surtech, which was like a, that one of their friends had, had, uh, had formed uh, as, as a way of answering a certain kind of demand. So it was like an indie uh, publisher for the first time. And Lane talked about this period in, in great detail yesterday. Uh, Elite, huge hit of the, of the mid 80s was coded by David Braben and Ian Bell, who were two undergraduates at Cambridge University. And it was the first indie title with 3D graphics uh, as the first space trading game, as far as I know. It's, Definitely the first really big hit that was based on procedural worlds, which are like uh, 
absolutely characteristics of indie games today. Uh, and like many other indies of the day, it was published by uh, Firebird, which was a division of British tele Telecom. Now, people were also self-publishing at the time. There was literally, uh, in the most literal sense, a cottage scene in England uh, that was producing major hits. So uh, Tim and Chris Stamper, long before the days of Donkey Kong Country and GoldenEye, were making games in this tiny little house in the English Midlands, and they formed their own publishing house, Ultimate, and they did it the traditional way. They did fulfillment themselves, they dealt with retail. And some of the biggest hits in this period were self-published uh, indie games using the share shareware model that I mentioned before. So id Software did Commander Keen as shareware, and then they would later do Wolfenstein and Doom and Quake under that model as well. Many indies at the time were continuing to depend on traditional publishers, though, for distribution, uh, distribution and marketing, uh, even though they were developing in a very, very much an indie way. So this game, Shadow of the Beast, is an Amiga game that was made by uh, uh, Martin Edmondson and Paul Howarth. Uh, they formed a little studio. They called it uh, Reflections, uh, which is now working on Watch Dogs for Ubisoft. Published then by Psygnosis, which published a lot of indies at the time, as one of these publishing houses that was really buying up a lot of, of indies. Uh, another game published by uh, Psygnosis at the time was uh, Lemmings, which I'm sure a lot of you have played. A really huge international hit, topped the charts for months and months and months. It was written by Dave Jones. It's a kind of interesting indie story. So he was a developer in Dundee, Scotland, so freshly out of high school. And he was just paying himself and he was exploiting these, uh, he had like a Fagin gang of, uh, of high school students. Uh, who were unpaid, who just liked to hang around him because they thought he was cool. They've written this uh, history up on the internet. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, so, you know, with, his, uh, with one of these students, Mike Daly, uh, he co-made Lemmings. Uh, here's a, here's, they've got these great pictures on their website. Uh, and that's what it was like in their studio. It was, it was as indie as could be. That company, of course, went on to become Rockstar Games and made Grand Theft Auto and is now one of the biggest uh, companies in the world. In Western Europe at, the, uh, at this time, and in Scandinavia, the indie scene was largely synonymous with the demo scene. So there was a handful of guys behind this Amiga demo, went on to form a company called Digital Illusions. They thought, let's make a game. So they made this pinball game called Pinball Dreams, which did reasonably well. But you probably know them better for making this game. So that's Epic, Rockstar, Dice, Id. You know, sometimes the answer to where did the indie, Indies go is, well, they made all this money and uh, they decided to hire hundreds and hundreds of people and they stopped being Indie in any kind of meaningful way. <laughs> but that doesn't mean they weren't Indie in the first instance. Just before I move away from the demo scene, you know, the, the, the Scandinavian demo scene also generated uh, Thomas Corpy's masterpiece physics game, uh, Fight of the Sumo Hoppers. This is one of my uh, favorites. And the reason I just wanted to touch on this is I'm just barely telling you anything about the uh, Scandinavian demo scene indie development uh, that was going on. And I'm not even touching the Spanish MX MSX scene, the Japanese Dojin amateur scene, the Soviet hobbyist scene that we know almost nothing about, and dozens of other indie game scenes that were going on at the time. I can only tell you about the ones that went on to be massive successes because that's where the history has been fleshed out. Okay. Finally, there's this idea that, that goes around that, that the new indie games are, are more creative and more experimental, and more weird uh, than anything that came before. Like that's, that's what we're about in, in indie games at the moment is, is like creative, unbridled creativity. I want to challenge that too. So outside of the USA and Japan, the entire world, you can say, was, was gripped with indie fever. Uh, so in the 80s, most of the, most of the hit games we're coming from these home computer hobbyists and these people just writing out of their bedroom. So this is a game by Jeff Minter called Hover Bother. Uh, he's one of the few still around making games as an indie today, just by himself, in much the same way as he was in 1983. Uh, he, he was uh, making, he's making them now. He's just put out a game on the PS Vita. Uh, Hover Bother is kind of quintessentially indie game. You're a guy who's stolen his neighbor's mower so that you can mow your lawn and you're trying not to get caught. It's personal. It was personal to Jeff Minter, who's often stealing <laughs> mowers. This is a game that bears a strong resemblance to Hohokam. It's called Fat Worm Blows a Sparky. Uh, 
really like, I mean, I think you, if you saw that today, you, if it was running a slightly higher frame rate, you might uh, think it was a modern indie game. Cliff Johnson uh, released this cryptic artsy puzzle game called The Fool's Errand in 1987, and he did pretty much nothing as far as I can tell but work on the sequel until 2013 when he finally put it out. It's so indie, right? It's so indie. And the Mac was this kind of niche platform uh, for most of this time, and it became th the locus of a particular indie scene that uh, shared so much in common with our indie scene right now. So Dark Castle is a weird game. It's one of these ones that kind of died, that this, this genre died out. Uh, we don't have games like that anymore. But it's notable because it's one of the first remote indie collaborations. So it was made by Mark Pierce and Jonathan Gay, who were sending each other discs in the, in the mail. Not by email, but slow mail, sending each other discs until they had finished it. It was a really big hit. People often, when I talk to people about Amiga development in, in America, they just say, oh, that didn't happen here, you know. It was not, uh, America didn't have the Amiga. Uh, but the, there was an Amiga scene, there was an Amiga hobbyist scene, an indie scene in, in America too. It's just they were mostly selling to people in overseas markets. So this is a game by the late Bill Williams, uh, it's an indie classic that was not, it was published by a US Gold, so it did have a big publisher, but it was not funded by them, and he made it all by himself. And it totally wouldn't look out of place uh, in the indie section of Steam now. It's this quintessential, brilliant, and yes, pretent pretentious indie game. Uh, it even came with a book of poetry and ink drawings that the author had made, and a cassette tape with his homemade music. A lot of people think that art games started with, uh, with Rod Humble's The Marriage, but that just, they were just always there as well. So the first thing that I want you to get out of this talk is that indie developers never went away. They never went anywhere. Uh, some of them grew their companies, sure, they stopped being indie. Some, some washed out, some moved on, some are making banking software. Uh, but as a group, as a kind of a movement, they remained. They were there the whole time. And they were driven to make games. They had to make games, just like you and I have to make games. And they did it on a huge variety of platforms, continuously, from the golden age of arcades through the current day, not just in America and Japan, but in England, Spain, Finland, Russia, Australia, and dozens of other places I've just totally neglected to mention. And nearly all the things we think about as being essential aspects of the contemporary indie scene were always there, year upon year. So the non-technical hobbyists, the, 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 the tools, uh, didn't start with Game Maker. They started at least as early as, uh, as Load Runner. And they were present every year following that. Electronic distribution doesn't start with Steam or Xbox Live Arcade. You know, it starts with BBSs and university mainframes. And it was still used every year after that. There were big indie superstars making a lot of money going back to the beginning. The biggest upside of being indie as well, like in, I think in any sense of the, of the word, is uh, there's no creative limits. There's uh, experimentation, there are personal games, there are weird games, and that's the oldest thing about indie games. It goes back right to the beginning and was there all the way through history. So for me, it's hard to feel worried about the indie movement falling apart when you look at where we stand in history, you know, not at the height of a bubble that started in 2008, but at the top of a tree that started in the 1960s or earlier. And you could still be worried, I guess, about where we're headed, uh, like, like Edmund is. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So I should say, you know, in the first place, I've called this State of the Union. I definitely don't see myself as the president of indie games. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of arguing for the exact opposite of that. So that's, that's where I'm going with the second part of this talk. So it's not as though, I mean, I've been talking about all the things that have been the same well, you know, year after year. It's not as though nothing genuinely new happened in the mid-2000s. So one of the things that happened in the mid-2000s was we started to appropriate this term indie uh, from music and film into games. Uh, and it started to take on that set of loadings and uh, meanings and, and framings into this particular sort of term that, that references this particular scene, this particular group of people that many of, of you in this room uh, are part of. So that was a genuinely new uh, development. People weren't really using the term indie 
uh, you know, as Lane said, they, they used it in, in 1980 and in 1981, but it kind of went away. It was not really a term that was being thrown around. So that's, that was something that was genuinely new in the mid 2000s. And then in 2008, there's this sense that there's a kind of mainstream breakthrough, right? That, that indie games is having its indie rock moment. That suddenly after years of being kind of geeky, <laughs> this kind of technical thing, we're suddenly we're cool, right? So I was gonna call this the braid moment. I don't think that's right, it's the tuning moment. This is Cactus accepting an award for uh, tuning. That's our moment, that's when we became cool. The last thing that happened in the mid 2000s that was new is there was this population boom of indie developers. So uh, this is a this is a quote from the GDC survey in 2013. So they found that 53% of the respondents, this is people who went to game developers conference, uh, identified as being indie. And of those, 51% had been indie develop developers for less than two years. Right. Uh, they also said that only less than a quarter of those people uh, had worked with a of the sorry of the whole survey said they had worked with a publisher on their last game. So there's this kind of huge population shift where everyone's going indie, and suddenly there are all these people who weren't even any kind of game developer before who are now uh, identifying as being uh, indie game developers, like hundreds of thousands of them. And the, the reason why I guess uh, mostly is down to mobile, right? There's this big explosion of app development, it's this gold rush. Uh, mobile development isn't cool like uh, Cactus is cool or like Indie Game the, the movie is cool but that's where the majority of the change is coming from this huge demographic wave and this kind of brings me to my main point about the current state of affairs is led to this Cambrian explosion of diversity in Indie Games. Now I should say I'm not talking about the diversity of backgrounds or voices or perspectives. I mean yes we have big problems with a long way to go on that but I'm talking about this huge explosion in diversity in the things people are making and the ways that they're going about doing it so I just want to walk through that a little bit so you know everybody uh, everybody uh, recognizes the indie superstars like that game company and Jonathan Blow this you know, journey it's like game of the year game of the year won all of these prizes everybody recognizes that most of the people in this room would recognize the <laughs> online stunt games like Frog Fractions or Candy Box or Cow Clicker, and uh, you know those are indie games too. Nobody would contest that. Uh, here in New York, we have this uh, burgeoning new arcade scene, as that's what we call it, and many of the people in this room would have seen these arcade installations made by indie developers like Hit Me by Kaho Abe. And then there are gallery shows of games like Fly Wrench, these freeware games with this artistic sensibility. And those are, those are definitely recognized and perceived as being indie as well. All of those games are perceived as being indie and they're tagged with that heavily overloaded term, but it's the tip of this incredibly large iceberg of games that are excluded in some way from the, from the indie classification. And just to start with, there's the academic research games like Facade or Ski Stun Simulator, which are not generally thought of as being uh, indie games. <laughs> Facade is a game about this guy who hates melons. <laughs> now, obviously, uh, Knit Stories is an indie game. Nobody would deny that. But I think just like Load Runner in 1983 and Cross in 1987, Knit Stories shipped with a level editor. Now I want to tell you that, that the people who are making their own levels, their own stories in Knit Stories and ZZT Worlds and sharing them, they're indie developers too. The kids who make Minecraft servers and set up these giant video game worlds in Minecraft, that's indie game development as well. It's the same impulse, right? It's the same creative spirit, it's a similar skill sets, the same budget. And people who make mods like Counter-Strike, that's indie game development. The Twine makers are indie game developers even though Mainstream gamers often assume, uh, accuse them of not just not being indie, but not even making games. This is uh, the wonderful positive space by Merit. Works like Proteus or The Path, those are indie games too, even though the developers don't necessarily identify the work with the term games, at least you could say they're indie. And I think the casual game scene on Facebook, mobile, and on computers as well, 
is a hugely ignored indie scene, right? So, you know, Dan Cook, who made Triple Town, is, is often complained about feeling like a, an outsider amongst other indies. There's these unpublishable games, these glitch experience games nobody really talks about, like I'm Scared by Ivan Zanotti, which came out in 2012, or Zach Gage's Lose Lose, uh, or Dungeon, these things that couldn't be commercialized. And by the same token, your Crytek uh, calls itself indie, right? And maybe fair enough, I guess, because they don't take investment from a publisher and, you know, in some sense, independent. There's this whole history of amateur games, uh, am amateur game developers with, with no commercial ambitions whatsoever, especially in Japan. They get left out of what we, when we talk about indie as well. And then there's the niche guys the, making games who, who subsist <laughs> on these very small numbers of very enthusiastic, very passionate fans. So Dwarf Fortress is the one that you, you do know you would maybe count as indie. But here's another niche game that you probably wouldn't, right? So these guys make farming simulator games every single year. It's a small team serving much the same kind of need, this kind of niche interest in the same way. They're indie as well. The interactive fiction authors are indie game developers. The board game developers are indie game developers. Look at that. That's, that's the uh, conference at Essen. That's, uh, that looks exactly like a giant indie meetup or jam. The visual novel scene in Japan and increasingly in the West with authors like Christine Love, they're indie as well. And look, if we were to be completely honest, even some of the Flappy Bird cloners are indie, however much we may hate them. <laughs> they're small, scrappy teams, they're individuals, making stuff fast and self-publishing and sticking it to the man. To even think that all those different kinds of games, with all those different audi audiences and business goals and creative practices, to think that they could ever be part of a unified scene where everyone knows everybody else and everybody is like critiquing everyone else's game is kind of absurd, right? I, th I think to even act like it should be that way becomes this kind of elitist wish because you're imagining a future where literally hundreds of thousands of indie game developers form this huge uniform collective with all of its attention focused on this small number of luminaries right at the top. It's like, effectively, that's a dream of excluding people. And I think, it's, you know, this is the best illustration. A lot of the indie devs outs outside our immediate scene are treated like outsiders, they feel like outsiders, they feel excluded from the term indie, even though they have all the hallmarks, they have all the practices, all the characteristics of indie games. So no matter what your opinion of Flappy Bird is, it's just not believable to me that if Terry Kavanagh had made it first, or if Adam Saltzman had made it, or if I had made it, that there would be this huge fan backlash against it, right? That's something that is just evidence of this outsidership in indie games. So is the indie movement over? I think the answer to that is, is just no, right? You can say without reservation that there's more people making uh, things that are clearly, characteristically indie video games than ever before in history. Uh, there's more people making any kind of game than any previous point in history. The indie game movement is becoming separated and siloized and segregated. So Edmund's right about that, but that's a function of scale and diversity. It's not because people are failing to be focused on making games that they've got their priorities wrong. That's just, that's just a fact of life about something that's been a very positive change, at least in my mind. And I don't think indie has lost its meaning as a term either. I think the right way to think about it is that we were wrong to start using it in that heavily overloaded way that I mentioned to, to refer to this particular scene, this particular group of people at this particular time. The characteristics that marked us out as indie uh, weren't new, uh, and we were just the tip of this enormous emerging iceberg anyway. It's kind of a bullshit category from the beginning, just like it was in music and film. <laughs> so here's to the full range of people who are here and the endless numbers of people who aren't making indie games. Here's to the ones whose faces that we all recognize and to the ones that we don't. <laughs>
the freeware writers, the casual game designers, sorry Naomi, <laughs> the click and players, the art game auteurs, the mobile developers, the esporters, the not gamers, the visual novelists, the modders, the hackers, the five-year death marches, the old timers, the twiners, the gold miners. <laughs> indie games are dead, long live indie games. And I use that capital I with intent. Thanks. Time for questions. Go ahead. Yep. Great. Yeah, no, I, I hope people will fill this in for me because. Right. Okay. Hi, sorry, I have a really tiny voice. Um, thank you. I, I was just saying that he just captured everything that Indicate has been about since we started, which was including everyone that is working from a place of passion and without the support of uh, big corporate entities. So that inclusiveness ethos is very much what we started out with. And I also had a couple of footnotes of, oh, the other one was Tetris. Where's Tetris, where's SimCity, and where's Myst? Yeah, absolutely. I think Tetris is, uh, is a great example. I, you know, I wish I knew more about all the people who wrote games in uh, the USSR and behind the Iron Curtain that we don't know about. Because Tetris is the only one that we do know about, pretty much. And they had their own 8-bit uh, computing platforms, and they made a lot of games and it's it's like we just don't really have I, at least I can't access the history uh, to be able to talk about that I wish we could sorry I can't see very well into the back I've got a spotlight in my eyes can you wave your arm if you're asking a question no did I scare everybody away from asking questions <laughs> All right, well, maybe I should just uh, <laughs> leave it where, it's, uh, where it stands and let people out to uh, socialize and uh, talk with your fellow indie developers. Thank you. Thank you.